and I need the word. I need a word right now. And uh, I'm, I may be preaching, I may be the one preaching, but 80% of the time while I'm preaching, I'm getting it when you're getting it. They get downloaded. And uh, from the kingdom of God to you, and it's fresh mamma. It's not that stale bread. Uh, so, sometime I leave here, and uh, we're on our way home riding, and I tell Sister Babers, I got it when y'all got it. Uh, God will pour himself out fresh and new in the minds of the people that's seeking him. God has something new for you if you will seek his face. Personally, he has something new for you if you cry out to him and fast and pray. He'll download fresh mamma into your personal lives. I'm so happy um, today that um, you're here to hear what God have to say. Now the online people won't hear it till we put it on television. Matter of fact, and I don't say it there's a few times, and I, I think sometimes people take offense to it, but I don't mean for them to take offense to it. But watching it at home is not the same. Now, it's better, it's a lot, a whole lot better than nothing. Amen, that's trying to, that's like looking at Hawaii on your television. <laughs> Amen. I don't care how they show the beach and the mountains, it's not like being in Hawaii. Amen. That's like talking to somebody during FaceTime that you love. It ain't the same. They're all in another state. You got some FaceTime, but you ain't got no personal time. Amen. So we're here today, and I thank God that he brought us here so we can get what we need for carry us on to the next level in our lives. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we do need you so much. We cannot make it without you. You're more than just our Savior. You is our very present help, even in time of trouble. And so we in we invoke your presence by saying thank you for all the things that you are and all the things that you have done. Lord, we know we could have never made it this far without you. And so we, are, we boldly give you praise. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. We are not ashamed of your name, God or your word, Lord Jesus, for it's the power of salvation to those that believe. Thank you right now for every ear that is here. I pray the ears are spiritual and the eyes are spiritual, that they may see and hear what you're saying. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. Let everyone give him the highest praise. Glory. Luke chapter 12, we're starting there in Luke chapter 12. We're going to look at uh, a few verses of Luke 12. We're going to start at uh, verse 15. We're just going to look at verse 15. Uh, well, let's just read a few verses so we get the content, content of this, these scriptures. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 says, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak unto my brother, to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, 
man, who made me a judge or a ruler uh, over you, a divider over you? And uh, he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. Listen at this verse. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things which, abundance of things uh, which he possess. Uh, and then I want you to look at verse 21. So, uh, verse 20 and 21. But God said unto him, thy fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You may be seated in the presence of the almighty God. Amen. Now, uh, Jesus began to reveal to um, this man that came to him about money. And money really means material possession. If you have money, there's nothing you can't buy. There's nothing you can't possess in the natural realm. Money can buy you the most expensive home, most expensive car, and let you live a lavish lifestyle. That's what money can do. Money can take away all financial worries. And, but that's certain thing money can't do. Money cannot bring you spiritual things. And our lives does not, does not consist or does not exist. The life of a human being is not in things that money can buy. The ultimate goal of a lot of human beings is to possess things and wealth. That's the ultimate goal that a lot of human beings has. And it's the wrong goal. It's a good goal but it's not the completing of the purpose of a human being. Whenever a person thinks that spiritual, I mean, say natural possession is the ultimate goal in life, to have a lot of money, a lot of things, when they think that is the ultimate goal in life, they're going to wind up so miserable. They don't know it yet, but they'll wind up so miserable because they, once they reach that ultimate goal, they're gonna ask themselves, is this all it is to life? That's why you see a lot of suicide, people commit suicide that are millionaires and billionaires. You say, why in the world would a billionaire commit suicide? He has everything. No, he doesn't. He made his ultimate goal money. And when he reached that goal, he found out there was no life in it. And that's why he keep buying, he will keep buying, or she will keep buying another house, another car, more clothes, keep trying to get this high to make them think that there's gotta, there's gotta be something that will bring life in possession. Now, when Jesus was talking to a man, he said, a, a man, now listen to Jesus. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possessed. Now, how many of you believe Jesus knew what he was talking about? All right. So Jesus said, listen, no human being, life is in the abundance of things he possessed. So, but in our world, we think it got to be. Wealth, material, uh, possessions, and meaning I can buy any, I can buy a Rolls Royce, a private jet, I can have condos and houses in the Caribbean and go anywhere. That's got to be life. But Jesus said, no, it's not. A man was never put on earth to make that, a man or woman would never put on earth to make that possession of things, the ultimate goal. Number one, if a human being's ultimate goal is possession, 
when they get to heaven, they won't have any rewards, even if they get to heaven, because most people are chasing things are not chasing Jesus. So even if they get to heaven, let's say it's a saint, a believer, when they get to heaven, none of those earthly things, if that's what their goal, will add up to any heavenly rewards. They'll get to heaven and God will say, you didn't do nothing for me on earth. Everything you did was for you. So all those things that you possess did not build up kingdom rewards. Now, he's not against things. Now, don't get me wrong. Listen very carefully to what I'm saying to you today. When things is the ultimate goal of a human being, listen very carefully. When things are the ultimate goal of a human being, they have a short vision of what life is all about. Let, let me give you some natural examples. You get a little boy who loves football. He may be like playing, what, a little peewee football? Whatever, they don't call it peewee football? All right, he playing peewee football. He's maybe like six, seven, eight years old. Uh, what time they, what, how, what age are they when they start playing little football, flag football, five? Okay, a five-year-old start playing football. The ultimate goal of that five-year-old, even at five, running up and down the field, the ultimate goal of that little five-year-old, he didn't imagine one day at five. See, he ain't thinking about that little peewee football. He ain't thinking about playing football as, uh, in junior high and high school and college. He went beyond, he done went beyond all of that. He done went to the Super Bowl. <laughs> See, his ultimate goal is not to be a good peewee football player. His ultimate goal is not to be a good high school football player or college. In his imagination, he done went all the way to the Super Bowl because the Super Bowl is the ultimate goal of every pro football player. You know, you can play pro football all your life and never make it to the Super Bowl. They are not happy just being a pro. They're they, 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 they pretty good, but they're not satisfied just making it too pro. <laughs> you ask Charles Bartley. He, Charles Bartley is in the Hall of Fame, but he never won an NBA championship. His goal was not just to make it to the Hall of Fame. He wanted to be champion. So the ultimate goal of that five-year-old in his mind, he see himself in the Super Bowl, making the winning play, being the MVP. So everything in between that, all, watch this, the, the, the exercising, the eating right, the weight room, all of that is a prelude to a goal. And the ultimate goal is he see himself doing that. Same thing with people who play soccer. They see themselves in the World Cup, making a final kick with one second left. And everybody lifting them on the shoulder, they the hero. That's the ultimate goal. That's in the natural. If a Christian ultimate goal is just to make a lot of money, then they've fallen short of the Super Bowl of the kingdom of God. Because the Super Bowl of the kingdom of God is not just making earthly possession. God already have all the money he needs. He just don't have all the servants, servants he needs. Amen. He don't, all, he, don't, he don't already have the best husbands on earth who let their light shine. He don't have the best wives he don't have yet. He's trying to bring us to our perfection in who we are on earth. And sometimes we think that, well, the goal is to make a lot of things. And she said, no, your life does not consist in the abundance of things which you possess. Now listen carefully. That's why so many people are so unhappy in life. We have the wrong goal. Amen. We have the wrong goal. If you have the wrong goal, you're going to accomplish that goal and you're going to be empty. Like some people's goals say, well, 
I just want to marry. If that's all you want to do, if you just want to get married, but you don't have the ultimate goal of being the best spouse you can be, you just want to have a warm body beside you. And that thing gonna fall apart. Cause you don't have a goal beyond physical, what word I want to use? Not attraction. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you think about being physical, having someone to be physical with, in a physical sense. And someone, yeah, yeah, I know, I don't want to say all that stuff. I, I hear y'all. It's family hour. That's why marriages fall apart. What was your goal when you got married? To have somebody physically beside you? I know you stood up here and said, for better, for worse, sickness, health, until your death do your part. Richer and poor. But did you hear poor, sickness? Worse? The goal should be until death do your part. Most folks until goal is until you get on my nerve. <laughs> There's a lot of ups and downs. You got to have a goal. It's so awesome when you see people who done went through it all, but somehow they found a way to make it work. Because the goal is really until death do your part. But most people don't have that in mind. They're looking at physical, sexual, lusting, and when you get tired of that, you, re you realize, is this all the marriage? <laughs> Amen. Is this all marriage is about? No, it should have been more, but your goal wasn't more. Amen. What is your goal? Oh, if you get married, is your goal just to build a house? You can build a house without making it a home. and fuss over who's going to pay the bills. We have to understand what, what Jesus is talking about when he says in this 21st verse, Jesus said, so, it, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and watch the last part, and is not rich toward God. You know what Jesus just said? A person who has a lot of stuff on earth for themselves, but they are poor in spiritual things. He said, that's not what the kingdom is about. He said, your goal was to be rich on earth, but have nothing in the kingdom? He said, I didn't put you on earth for natural things only. I put you on earth for a kingdom purpose. So when the man was bragging about, I have much things laid up for what, many years? Jesus said, okay. The father spoke from heaven. He said, okay, since you think that stuff is your life, God then said, I'm going to call for your life tonight. Now, who's going to enjoy your stuff? Amen. You don't have nothing in heaven. You're not even rich toward God, so I'm going to call for all them hard things you work for and tell me who's going to enjoy them. See, nobody can enjoy the things you laid up in heaven but you. The things that you've done for God, he reward you for it, and nobody else can get it. So if you spend your whole life chasing natural things, <laughs> You know, we live in a time now where the average person may get married five or six times in a lifetime. Or they may get married at least three times. Definitely two. Most people. Very few marriages last all to death do apart. And you may ask yourself, what then happened? What have happened? People, again, if you're chasing, don't have an ultimate goal and it's a physical goal, as soon as somebody 
stop looking like they used to look. Okay, let me go. As soon as the spouse you marry quit looking like they used to look. So, cause you marry them, you marry them for the physical look. And sooner they get a little belly, as soon as her shape leave from the Coke Cola bottle to the two liter, You was attracted to the physical person. And they, don't, they are not as physically attracted to you now. And age does that. I don't care how much you work out. Well, Father Time don't care nothing about no weight room. <laughs> Father Time will knock you out in the weight room. In time. It's good to be in a weight room and take care of your body, but there come a time when you're about 70, 80, Father Time meet you at the weight room <laughs> and tell you, I dare you lift it. <laughs> Everything in your body today gonna tell you <laughs> it's time to stop that. So what people do is when their ultimate goal in relationship is physical, they start looking for someone that looked like what they used to like. And don't realize they only look like they used to look. <laughs> the ultimate goal should be your marriage is to glorify God. When your ultimate goal in a marriage is our marriage will glorify God, we will make him the center of our lives and we will keep him, uh, uh, we will always keep him in the equation and whatever we do will glorify God. Our home will glorify God, our car will glorify God, the money he give us will glorify God. Everything God give us in the natural realm, it's gonna glorify him. That should be your goal. Thank you for the house, it's gonna glorify you. Thank you for this nice car. I'm gonna tell everyone if it had not been for the Lord who blessed me to have it, I'm gonna glorify God in the car, glorify God in the car. And then God, I'm gonna witness. I'm gonna tell people about you. My life will glorify you. It's not just to get stuff. And when you start getting that right perspective, you'll get more stuff than you ever can imagine. He'll add things to you. Every time you give God glory, he'll bless you with something. But when you chase the things, you find no life in the things. See, the ultimate goal of a Christian, I want to show you something Jesus did. The ultimate goal of a Christian is to glorify God. And sometimes we just chase it. Bills, money, I need, I need. I'm telling you, when you... Get the wrong perspective, a devil will use you to manipulate people for money. He'll, he'll take all your integrity, he'll take all your honesty, he'll, he'll let you do anything for money and you'll find there's no life in it. That's a certain thing we ought not do for money. Now I got a little y'all got lazy. I'll be like, no, my integrity is just in Christ. If I did that, that was not glorifying. I have too much integrity to, to do anything for money because it's not going to glorify God. The devil told Jesus, bow down and worship me. I'll give you all this stuff. Jesus said, no man shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall he serve. Jesus' ultimate goal on earth was the cross. Are y'all with me, church? Listen to The ultimate goal that Jesus had on earth was Calvary. When Jesus was healing the blind people, that were Wee football. The Super Bowl was the cross. 
when he had the lame walk and fed the 5,000 uh, with the two fish and five loaves of bread, he was playing junior high football. The Super Bowl was the cross. When Jesus came to earth, he saw the ultimate place I must wind up is in the Super Bowl on Calvary Hill. When I, when I give my life, that you may have life, and when I say, Father, I done your will. See, we thought, when we saw Jesus walk on water, that's it, Jesus know that ain't it. My, I know where the Super Bowl is at. I got to meet the devil on a field called Calvary. And the devil and I, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a battle for life and death. And on the cross, on Calvary Hill, somebody gonna win. So I'll feed the hungry now, Jesus was saying. I'll open blind eyes now. I'll let the dead, I'll, I'll raise some dead for, for a moment, and I'll uh, get the lame to walk. I'll cure the leprosy. But ultimately, I can get caught up. Jesus said, I cannot get caught up in this peewee football stuff. Suppose Jesus stood back and said, I know I got it made. I just walked on water. And God would have said, that's not the ultimate goal. Like someone said, I know I got a man, I just got married. That's not the ultimate goal. If that's all you think it, are, think it is, you'll never meet, meet, uh, reach the Super Bowl of your trials, your ups and your downs, and finally grow old together and look, and look back on your life and say, through it all, we made it. <laughs> if you've been married, divorce and remarried, I'm glad you're here. Try to make this on your last one. <laughs> you're in now, if you can maintain. I have to say that because I don't know what's going on in some homes. Amen. Um, I want no one to hear this and say, I got to stay in there, especially uh, if someone threatening your life and all them kind of things. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Need some deep counsel in there. Jesus is saying, listen carefully, Jesus is saying, and we're going to look at it in the 17th chapter of John. Go ahead and turn there. And watch what Jesus said about his ultimate goal. John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, verse 1, these words spoke Jesus and lift up his eyes to heaven. He's on the, and said, Father, the hour is come. Hallelujah. The hour is come. You know what he's saying? Game time. The hour is come. Game time. Jesus said, all that stuff I've been doing for three and a half years, it been, it been leading up to this hour. Someone shout game time. That's what Jesus said. It's game time. I don't heal the sick. I don't open the blind eyes. I don't make turn water into wine. And let the wedding go on. I did all that stuff. But the hour for which I was born, for which you put me on earth, has come. Hallelujah, somebody. You know what Jesus said? I didn't stop halfway. I didn't think that the little miracles I'd done were the ultimate goal for which I came to earth. Jesus said, there are people dying. They are wrapped up in sin. And he said, I came to, uh, I came to uh, redeem them from the sin of the world. When John the Baptist saw him, remember John said, behold, the Lamb of God would take away what? The sin of the world. John the Baptist saw the purpose of Jesus when he said, behold, here come the Lamb you kill a lamb. He sacrificed himself. And he said, here come a lamb of God which is going to take away the sin of the world. John had foresight for the purpose of Jesus coming to the earth. John said, he didn't just come to heal a few people. He came to be a sacrificial lamb. And behold, here come God lamb. What foresight John had. 
And here go the lamb on the cross, getting ready to go to the cross, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Yeah. It's time. It's game time. Amen. Know what Jesus said? I'm getting ready to meet the devil again on Calvary. This is a life and death Super Bowl. Victory. Somebody will be glad Jesus won. Hallelujah, somebody. You know why we're in church praising God today? Because he, got, he, he died. The devil clapped his hand. Listen, when, 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 when Jesus died, the devil said, look who won. When Jesus died on the cross, dropped his head in his shoulder, the devil said, look who won this battle. But what he didn't realize, that three days later, our Savior, come on here, somebody. Three days later, the grave could not hold him down. The game ain't over until it's over. Hallelujah, somebody. And three days later, death, who's death supposed to kept Jesus in the grave. You know, when you put somebody in a grave, death in, grave, in the grave supposed to hold them. Amen. And when, G when the devil saw Jesus go to the grave and he was dead, the devil said, all power is in my hand. But Jesus said that Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days. So must man, son of man be in the heart of the earth for three days. But on the third day, yeah, can you imagine death and the grave wondering what's going on? Because they were losing their grip early that third day morning. And the grave probably looked at death and say, something moving in this tomb. <laughs> you might want to call the devil up to let him know we can't hold him any longer. <laughs> Tell the devil, stop the party. Tell the devil, stop celebrating. Because this man that was dead is getting up. Yeah. Hallelujah, somebody. This man who died for our sin, death can't hold him any longer. The grave can't hold him any longer. On the third day, he got up. Listen, church. There was one enemy. I want y'all to hear me clearly. There was one enemy that man could not defeat. The enemy that man could not defeat was death. So Jesus came to earth and said, okay, since y'all can't beat him, I'll whip him for you. So when he died, the ultimate goal was to give us life. How many of y'all glad you have life today? Now listen, not life in a house. The house is to glorify God. You got life because Jesus lives inside of us. That's why we have life. Watch what Jesus says. Oh, God. Watch what he says. He says, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify you. You know what Jesus just said? Now, watch what he's saying. The hour has come. Hear me, church. The hour has come. I want you to glorify me. Oh, Jesus. He said, glorify me. Please keep your eyes up here. He said, you know what Jesus really said? Let's go to the end. He said, glorify me that I may glorify you. He said, in order for you to get glory, I got to be put on the cross. <laughs> See, because, look, listen, if I gave you a, uh, an orange today. As, put, as, as beautiful as the texture of an orange is, you will never get the glory out of the orange until you put some pressure on it and squeeze it and the juice come out. Jesus had to put, put on, on the cross and they had to squeeze the blood out. 
The glory was when he shed it blood. <laughs> Y'all ain't hear me. The price, look, the price of the glory would be blood shed for our sin. You, Jesus had to get under pressure with the nail. The nail was pressure. When you open your hand and you put a nail there and you put the pressure on it, blood come out. When you put the feet together and put nails in it and you put pressure on the nail, blood come out. Jesus was put under pressure and the blood came out and the blood was the glory. We are blood brothers and sisters with Christ because he shed it for us. We are in the family of God because he shed the blood. So it was under pressure. Everyone say under pressure. It was under pressure that the glory came out. Watch this. If you're not a child of God wrapped up in the thing, things of the Spirit, when you're under pressure, frustration come out. You get loud. You start fussing at people. You get, you get, you get aggravated. You get stressed out. If you see, if, if, if all you are seeking after is a house and a car, after a while, when the pressure come on and the money ain't there, when pressure come, the true you gonna show up. Whatever, whoever you are, and whatever you are, whatever in you, under pressure, it come out. Some people say, I don't cuss no more. I quit cussing. Well, we got to see how you act under pressure. You may not cuss as long as things are smooth, but when people put pressure on you, if cussing in you, cussing coming out. When you're seeking after Jesus and the marriage is going bad and pressure on the marriage, you still let the glory shine. If you're working on a job and the employees getting on your nerve and you wrapped up in Jesus, when they put pressure on you, you say hallelujah. That's why you are to seek things of the realm of the spirit because pressure is coming. And when pressure comes, no material things is going to get you through your trials. Seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll get these things to you. Can I share something with you? Life is tough. Don't let nobody fool you like you walk through 70, 80, 90 years of life without tough times. Life is tough. There's some, there's some days when, the, if you have not taken care of some things, there's some days when the most simplest thing will be this cam the straw that break the camel back. Life tough, and you got to get tough by being in the glory of God. Again, the ultimate goal, what is your ultimate goal in life? A house? A car? Millions of dollars? You think that's going to do it? I'm here to tell you. In the end, without Christ, all you have is possession. And sometimes when people don't know how to handle it, the more you get, the more problem it causes. There's a lot of people who can get along the longer they broke. <laughs> they love each other, everything happy, they broke. But Lord, when money gets in between them, amen somebody. They don't know how to continue to give God glory. Greed come. Let's try to close. Let's go to Genesis and we'll close. Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 28. Verse 15. Genesis chapter 28, verse 15. These trips to deal with Jacob. Jacob is running from Esau, his brother, because he done stole his birthright. He done stole the blessing. His brother's so upset, Esau wanted to take him out, kill him. 
So Jacob is on the run. He has very little food, very little clothing, no water. And really, he's, he's going to perish. He's going to die if God don't show him his ultimate goal. And so that night, Jacob lay down, and God speaks to him in verse 15. And this is what God says. And behold, 15 and uh, 16, uh, he said, uh, and behold, I am with you. I will, watch this, I will keep thee in all places for that I goest. I'm going to bring, and I will bring thee again into this land. Now watch what God says. For I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. You know what God just said to Jacob? He said, Jacob, I'm not finished with you. The reason I put you on earth is not to die tonight on this rock. You're not going to die on this rock. Now, everything in the natural realm say you're going to die on this rock, but you're not dying on this rock. I'm not done with you. I have a spiritual purpose for you, Jacob, and you're not dying tonight. There's some things you need to fulfill. Glory be to God for the kingdom. If Jacob had died that night, we wouldn't have had Joseph. <laughs> and if that bloodline had been cut off, we wouldn't have had Jesus going in the bloodline. So what God said to Jacob that night, listen, you may not have money, you may not have a house, you may not have a, 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 a camel to ride. You may not have all the material things, but what you have tonight, I'm with you. Amen. Jacob wind up with more camels, more goats, more sheep, men, serpents. He wind up, wind up being a rich man, but that night he had nothing but God. And God says, you may not have this stuff, but what you have is me. And if you have me, you'll get the stuff later. Yeah. I'm not going to leave you on this rock tonight. I'm not finished with you. Please hear me. The reason you and I are alive today is God is not through with us. I hope y'all hear me. The reason God woke you up this morning, he's not done with you. The reason you didn't die in an accident five or six years ago, lately the car couldn't, accident couldn't take you out, a slip and fall couldn't take you out, because God was saying, I'm not through with you. Can anybody look back over their life and see a few times that you could have been taken out? You could have been dead? You know why you didn't die that night? God said, there is still purpose. Come on, somebody give him a praise. God said, that's still purpose. Don't you sit around being depressed, talking about who don't like you. God loves you. Don't be worried about who broke your heart. God will mend your heart. Don't be worried about being broke today. Broke today don't mean broke tomorrow. God has purpose. If you're alive, God has purpose for you. Don't let your hard time of the day be the ultimate reason you give up. God ain't done with you. Matter of fact, take a deep breath in. Breathe out. That let me know God ain't done with you. Somehow to stop, let's stop right now and give God a praise up in here. Come on, magnify him. He's not done with you. Quit murmuring about what you don't have and give God praise for what you do have. And God will begin to open doors that nobody can shut. God ain't through working on you. God ain't through with your temperament. You ain't got the right temperament yet. You get angry too quick. God got to still work on you. So he woke you up this morning to say, I got to work on your attitude. Because before I get through with you, you will have the right attitude. You will know how to talk to people. You, you will learn how to take some stuff without retaliating. God said, I got to wake you up again to build you up because I'm not through with you yet.
That's a situation that you got to go back and get right. I'm not through with you yet, said the Lord. Amen, somebody. You ain't walked in purpose yet. You ain't made it to your spiritual Super Bowl yet. God said, that's why I keep waking you up. You think I'm waking you up for another house, another car, or making more money. That's part of some things, but he said, ultimately, I'm waking you up to build on you. Yeah. I'm waking you up to make a better you. I'm on a better you. Hallelujah. That's why I put you through that trial last week. That's why them people got on your nerve last week. I was trying to make a better you. Amen. All you want to do was get away from them. All you, you left there talking about them, and you didn't get the purpose. I was working on you through them. Amen. I was trying to shape and mold you so you could be a leader in the kingdom of God. So I put the wrong people in your mind, in your place, so they would deal with you to make you who I want you to be. But you just call them devils. They ain't devils. They are, the, they are, they are angels sent by me to work on you. Amen. And even if there is the devil, you don't let the devil make you act like the devil. Amen, somebody. God said, all this stuff you're going through, all the relationship problems you're going through, I'm working on you. And you keep talking about your so-and-so get right. If so-and-so straighten up, I'll be better. No, you're going to get better when you understand purpose. Purpose don't depend on somebody else acting better. Purpose depends on you getting better. <laughs> the old song we had is not my mother, not my father, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. God is working on us. So when you leave here today and you go to your job or go back to your situation, look in the mirror. Quit looking at the person who calls you the aggravation and, and realize with no pressure, no gain. No people on your job and no people in your life that putting pressure on you is trying to draw out the glory. Can I preach to y'all? They trying to pull out glory in you. Hallelujah. And when you get through understanding purpose, you'll be like the Apostle Paul. What would Paul say? The Apostle Paul said, when Paul got to the end of his life, he didn't just say, it's ready to die. I'm ready to die. Paul said, I finished in my course. I, I kept the faith. I did what God wanted me to do. Paul said, I made it to the Super Bowl. I, I finished, and I won. Amen, somebody. That's what's going on in your life today. Quit running from your trials. Stand up and say, this is my day of pressure. And pressure going to bring, bring glory. You'll never understand how to have a kind heart until somebody break it. <laughs> you can't have a kind heart until somebody do you wrong and break yours. When somebody break your heart and do you wrong, that was the opportunity to let glory come out and do the right thing. God had to break the heart to mend the heart. Allow the heart to be broken so he can mend it. So your trial is to develop you. And so, please don't make money your goal only. You're going to be most miserable. Please don't make a house your goal only. You're going to be so miserable. Serving God with possession, with him being the center and not the possession, and giving God glory for all that he has given you, that's where life is at. Hallelujah. Jesus, again, thou, thou fool. Your life don't consist in the abundance of things which you possess. Now tell me, whose thing, the, those things you work so hard for, know what you're saying. He has the right to call for our life anytime he get ready. Then he said, but tell me who things. And I'll close with this. 
I'm going to tell you something about things. You can work all your life for stuff. And the very person you dislike the most may wind up sleeping in your bed. Mm-hmm. 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 I'm, I'm talking about even after you're dead. I'm talking about after you're dead now. I ain't talking about... <laughs> Let me get that part in there. That's what Jesus asked the man. Tell me who... You don't know who's going to have your stuff. So don't make stuff your life. Glory. Come on, Glory. God is so good. I pray that you take this word and you let it marinate. And you make, and you make your, everything you do in life better. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You make people that you come involved with better. You quit looking over the fence the grass always look green on the other, other side until you get over there. Anywhere that green grass, it take a lot of mowing and fertilizing and cultivating. And if you wasn't, if you wasn't a good cultivator, know how to mow, mow grass, even when you get over there, you can't keep it. Your grass was dead before you went over there. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father God, we say thank you right now. Come on, give him a praise in this church. Magnify him with me. Hallelujah, Jesus. Matter of fact, let's take the next minute or so just to give God praise and glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you for his word today. Come on, give him glory for his word today. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah.